I'm a firm believer that everyone has moments they're proud of and moments that make you dread your mistakes. I'm proud of every video on my channel, except for one. If there's one pet peeve I have is making rushed or bad quality content, and it's like a cuckoo that keeps pecking at me, it haunts me to this day. When I did my personal top 10 worst Zelda bosses, I made several mistakes. It was rushed because I was making the top 10 disappointing video games, I brought up entries for very stupid arbitrary reasons. I lashed out at the fan base at which, that's a no-no. I put in a rant that was irrelevant or I just didn't expand on the entry well enough. Anyways, I'll spare you the details, but after playing through all of the Zelda games from my last countdown, I truly want to redo the list and set it right. So, there's only one rule. There is a difference between a mediocre and a frustrating boss. A mediocre boss is a boss you can pick on like a they're too easy, like with King Dodongo from Ocarina of Time. But they're not annoying to get past. I'm not focusing on those. I'm focusing on the ones that were tedious, frustrating, and just left a really sour taste in my mouth after doing them. With that, what else is there left to be said? Let's go. Oracle of Seasons and Ages are actually really stellar with their boss battles and have some strong variety with them. The head thwomp from Ages involves some strategy of timing to throw bombs into its head. Smog from Ages is a full on block puzzle boss and Dig Dogger from Seasons kicks ass with his magnetic gloves concept. Most importantly, they are bosses that are designed well for the game they're for. Well, mostly. However, Colm and Kotake from the end of both games are the two broomsticks in the mud to that experience. Let's look at another Zelda game involving Twin Rova with Ocarina of Time. The design works because you can tilt and steer your shield to reflect magic into the other sister. But since the Oracle games are in a top-down perspective, this becomes a problem. You don't have any proper aiming tools to work with. The sisters consistently rush around the area trying to fire off spells at Link and you can figure out pretty quick what you're supposed to do. Swipe from your sword to redirect the elemental spell into the other sister. That's not the issue. What makes this tedious is that you have to rely on pinball luck to rebound the spells where you want to go. If you play any pinball game out there, you know that the balls have minds of their own whenever you hit them off of the flippers and they go cascading all over the place. Works with pinball games. With Zelda, not so much. Especially since the witch that fires the spell, where Link is positioned, and where the target witch is, constantly keeps changing. You're at the mercy of luck when it comes to the accuracy in this battle. Fortunately, the reason I put it at number 10 is because you can get used to the janky mechanics the more you're around it. So it's not the worst boss in the world. But if it makes my blood twinge knowing that this boss is coming up, uh, that's not a good omen. Pride can be such a strange phenomenon. On the one hand, it helps you get confidence. But just like the stock market, if you invest the confidence in the wrong thing, it could end up with you making the mistakes. And then you're reminded that you're not invincible after all. Moldorm is a weird boss to me. When I came back to this boss after 12 years of not playing A Link to the Past, I got overconfident. Because I was a teenager back then, surely bosses like that are cheesecake material since I'm older. I kept swiping at his tail and kept myself secluded in the top left corner so that I wouldn't get knocked down. Then I thought, hey, this is pretty easy. It's a lot easier than I remembered it. And then, oh my gosh, I'm being patient. I'm trying, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> Oh. When Moldorm was close to getting killed, he gets crazy, like super crazy with his movements. Like, whoa, 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 holy cow, slow the heck down, and that was a serious kick to my pride. That's where the problems come into this fight is Moldorm's ludicrous speed towards the end of the battle. You know, when Moldorm only has one or two hits left. I think that having no guardrails isn't really a big deal if Link could manage to keep up with Moldorm. But with the monster bouncing around the area like a cat trying to get out of a bathtub, this battle turns into a sickening game of luck to keep yourself on the platform. I really hate that moment in a boss battle where you're so close, so close to finishing off a boss battle then 
No! And that's the part where the stab hurts the most. I have to do all this all over again. So I decided to read up on some Breath of the Wild videos about this on YouTube and their comments. You know, Breath of the Wild just came out, so it's natural I check out the boss on the internet's perception of it. Every Thunderblight Ganon video had two camps of Zelda players. One, the Zelda players who claimed they beat it in less than two minutes and found it pretty easy. Two, the camp that was exploding in frustration from the countless retries. You have to remember that Breath of the Wild is entirely open-ended on what events happen after the next. So it really comes down to how prepared and how skilled you are. I imagine those who had an easier time were more skilled with the timing of the backflip and shield, had more weapons, hearts, and equipment, probably had strategy guide help, figured out how to use magnesis, or came to this boss past the other ones. The other side, Zelda players like me, got the wrong deck of cards to work with. That's kind of where I have mixed feelings about this boss because it's technically a fun boss and it can potentially be a good boss, which is why this ranking is low because it has fantastic things going for it. But I'm more on the side of the fence that if Zelda players happen to have some bad timing with Breath of the Wild, there's the possibility that this boss will royally screw you over. If you want my version of it, I would imagine that it was slightly worse than my time with Moldorm from A Link to the Past. This is why I put it at number 8. I didn't have a lot of hearts this happened to be my first boss i had some shoddy equipment but mainly what made it horrible to play was the trial and error mess it just takes so much getting used to that it makes you red in the face in my opinion getting stuck on a boss for about 20 minutes just screams tedious i could talk about this boss more in detail but that would take around five minutes it's breath of the wild there's a ton of things to account for in this boss battle Now, most bosses in Link Between Worlds are pretty good. They utilize the merging mechanic well, they're fun and memorable, and overall, they hold the standards up pretty well. Plus, some are different from A Link to the Past, giving them a flavor of originality. Now there's some background you need to know about me first with Link Between Worlds before I explain this boss. I have muscle memory issues with this game. I want you to look at every 2D Zelda game. A Link to the Past, Minish Cap, the Oracle games. What do they have that Link Between Worlds doesn't? A single item slot. Link Between Worlds has two of them. So when I played through Link Between Worlds, this habit carried over. So I only used one item slot throughout the entire game of Link Between Worlds. No, I'm not kidding. To me, it was really jarring to keep track of two item slots after having played several 2D Zelda games with only one item slot. So, this brings me to Zaganaga. What does this have to do with Zaganaga? It's kind of a big problem. This boss is encouraged to use both item slots, one for the bow and one for the sand wand. So my mind had a horrendous time adapting to the abrupt change of control. Well, why not use one item slot? Because you're switching between the two items so fast, it'll be like putting the Iron Boots criticism from the Water Temple on steroids. It's so stupidly inconvenient. Since it is so inconvenient, I resorted to two item slots. So guess what? Now my brain is on scrambled eggs trying to get used to this f***ing control scheme. But of course, what about the obvious? Why not just use the sand wand in one item slot and get up close and personal with the sword? Problem is, I did, and I died a few times. He has a ton of health, so whenever I assaulted him that way, I ended up with the game overs. So, to be frank, I took the defensive approach with the bow after a few tries because it's a lot more manageable to keep an eye on his minions and attacks. You can say I suck, because I do suck at The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, and A Link Between Worlds. 
I'm not a robot. I have my weak points with video games along with everyone else. It is my personal list after all. But now here's the final kicker. Zaganaga is a hard boss. He constantly sends out little minions after you, changes his spot constantly, the battleground is limited to move on because of the sand wand, and then he'll use his wind attack to blow you clean off the platform. To make things way worse, it gets faster the more you hit it and it has a lot of health. Especially if you don't have the sword upgrades. So if you come to this dungeon earlier, oh, not good. So to me, it's because of this constant control held that I'm drowning in that makes this boss unbearable to play against along with the combination of how difficult this boss is that I've had to play it a few times. Boy, was it a big breath of fresh air to finally take down the bastard. Wind Waker is a fantastic Zelda game. All the things I talked about in the top 20 personal Zelda games like the ocean travel, in the end they're kind of small nitpicks compared to the overall positive experience. If Wind Waker is something I'll sit down for hours and play, I don't really have any big problems with it. Oh wait, I lied. There's a big flaw I won't ever forgive this game for. So I had to sit down for a long time and figure out why this set of bosses bugs me. I mean on the positive point you could say, oh you know how to kill them, just do it quickly and get it over with. It's not like they're annoying and frustrating technically as boss battles. And that's a good point, why do I resent these bosses anyways? And then I remembered some YouTube videos. I said something in my top 50 Sonic the Hedgehog songs along with what a few YouTubers said. So, the big question, do I like Sonic of 2006? No, Unfinished Games is a big red flag of getting on my bad side. Dangerous. I do love the- Clover Studios, I understand that the first match with Orochi was intense and amazing, but just because a boss is great the first time, doesn't mean it's a great idea to rehash it twice. It just makes what should be a sweet and memorable fight dull, repetitive, and monotonous. Still pretty Even more bad. So also, there's a shortage of dungeons, to the point where the game feels incomplete. Like after going through dungeons for the first two pearls, the third one is just given to you. Why couldn't there be a dungeon? I heard that at least two dungeons were cut before release to make a deadline. Like I understand producers rushing development along to make a deadline, but Nintendo should have never done this. I think what ticks me off about these bosses is that they're simply there. I think if they took these redundant bosses and changed them up like they did in Donkey Kong 64, it would have worked. But instead we get a small dosage of the Great Maze effect from Super Smash Bros. Brawl. The biggest crime is that it's there, with nothing new added with a bunch of padding. It's a copy and paste mess. It just screams lazy. Now we're getting to the bosses that really tick me off to the moon, so I apologize if I start sounding salty at this point. This next one is from Link's Awakening. You're probably thinking I'm talking about Master Stalfos like I did on my old list, but no. This one has me scarred for life. I have to ask, has anyone been in Turtle Rock? This is kind of a stretch because Smasher has been demoted to a mini boss at this point in the game, but I don't care. I want to beat that ball of his back in his face. Actually no, scratch that, because that's what makes this boss horrible. For anybody who isn't familiar with Turtle Rock, you're probably thinking, What? That cute thing? What's so annoying about it? <laughs> oh, let me tell you. It's not actually Smasher himself that's the problem, but the layout of the dungeon. Take a look at this dungeon layout. This is Turtle Rock. Now what you need to know is that the mini bosses, Hennix, Rolling Bones, and Smasher are repeatable bosses. As in, if you enter the room, they respawn, meaning you must kill them to pass the room. However, take a look at this red section. This is the southwest section where Hennix and Rolling Bones are. But the good news is that if you can get everything from this area, then you don't need to come back here. So there's no reason to fight them again. Now look at this yellow section. This is the navigation nightmare. 
There are tons of dead ends, it's hard to find leads, it's hard to find keys, the non-linearity is really disturbing, you need to keep track of hitting the orb here in the purple section to make sure you get the fire rod, you need to come back and hit these ice orbs later in the orange section, Oh, it's infuriating. Now this is what makes it dreadful, I got lost a lot in this dungeon, I'm a terrible navigator, I lost track of where anything went, there are so many pathways, it's nuts, so if you come into these two rooms in the green section, you're screwed. You have to fight Smasher before getting back into the dungeon. That's why I loathe this boss. On top of having the horrendous stress to explore the doggone tedious maze, there's a constant repeatable boss there to add several kicks to your insanity. After you face Smasher around 10 to 15 times, it's just agony. Sorry, but Colm and Kotake are not the worst bosses in the Oracle games in my opinion. There's something far more dreadful, far more sinister. This is the cheapest and most unfair boss in the Legend of Zelda series. Come out right now, you bloody red bat! I know this boss is easily skimmed over because it only takes around 2 minutes to beat. Well, potentially. In fact, it doesn't sound justified to make this list because of that. Also, it's another mini boss. I gotta remember to add that rule about doing mini bosses whenever I do another one of these boss lists. Vire is a wild fruit loop of a boss. Think of him like Moldorm in that he's kind of easy and manageable at the start of the fight, but then things get out of hand. What Vire does is circle the arena firing these blue and red fireballs at you and dodge your advances. Seems simple enough and then this is where the bullshit comes in. The problem with Byer is that it's impossible to read his cues. About 90% of bosses out there in the video game world have cues you can feed off of. You know, to tell what the boss is going to do next so that you can counteract it. Byer is so unpredictable and so speedy, it has a way to push your buttons. Well, at least mine. Think of it a little bit like the Lorinthia boss from Xenoblade Chronicles. What makes this boss incredibly frustrating? One of the reasons, I won't get into the other glaring issues with this boss, is that it relies more on being lucky or trial and error rather than actual skill. That embodies what I hate about Byer. It doesn't matter if you happen to be really good at this game. Vire lures you into thinking you're going to get up close and slash it confidently, but oop, he pulls the rug from under you and hits you in your face. This is the only part I die in seasons and ages nowadays. I hate teasing bosses. I hate teasing bosses. I'm going to... Now that red bat has become red blood on my wall. <sighs> Thunderbird is growing on me to start hating it the more I play against him. In fact, I'll go farther. The Great Palace is one of the worst Zelda dungeons in existence. Which is an ironic twist because that's the pride of Zelda 2. It's supposed to be hard. But when hard turns into unbalanced and cruel, it's not fun anymore. Why is level 6 of Ninja Gaiden so disliked despite the rest of the game being good? Why does everybody hate that corridor in Castlevania? Because it's unbalanced. So let's get to Thunderbird. It is very true that you can get accustomed to this dungeon and boss over time the more you play Zelda 2. But to be frank, I don't want to be that good. I'm content with playing the game every once in a while then putting it away. I don't want to dedicate my time to be flawless at the game. I want to play other games. So because I don't choose to be exceptional at the game, the Thunderbird boss is an exhausting boss after an exhausting dungeon. The fire droplets he spews out is relentless and ongoing. It's tough to jump to get that firm timing to swipe at its forehead while that fountain of fire is at work. And that's it. It's a very straightforward boss. A lot of it kind of speaks for itself. But yeah, Thunderbird, the less I think about him, the better.
Do you remember me in the Zaganaga entry that I was bad at The Legend of Zelda, the NES game? This happens to be the Zelda game that I am the worst at out of the entire series. If I were to put myself on a scale out of 10, I would say a 6. I'm good, but I've definitely made my large share of mistakes with this game. So now we've come to the number 2 entry in my personal list. But first, let me talk about going through the second quest for the first time. If anybody cringed, then you know how brutal and relentless this quest is. The secrets are far more elaborate. The enemy encounters and formations are ludicrous. The dungeons are in hysterically awkward places. The items are, no, no, not going there. Let me burn this into your soul. I've been wanting to say this since the top 20 Zelda games. The second quest is the hardest thing I've ever done in the Legend of Zelda series. It's because of this that I have to declare my number two entry to be... I remember vividly in Dungeon 4 when I was locked up with three Dodongos, which means guess what? If you run out of bombs, you have to die. I was stuck there for a long time having to gather bombs and get past the enemies. Dungeon 6 was rough with two bosses, plus there were a lot of lovely wizards to greet me to sap my health away. That one had me jammed for a long time. Dungeon 7 is pretty much a giant gauntlet of hallways for a few bosses and a ton of tough enemies. That one kept me busy for a while. As for Dungeons 8 and 9, bosses, bosses, bosses. EVERYWHERE! Holy crud, I have an amazing respect for Zelda players that can rise up to being the cream of the crop and pulling off the second quest, but wow! Normally you'd think I would be proud of this achievement, but I don't know. If you're bad at a game and struggle to get through it, I wouldn't call it fulfilling and rewarding. It felt more on the side of just wanting to beat the game so that I can say I did it and escape the torture chamber. The worst Zelda boss of all time is... Now believe it or not, I'm not going to criticize Vulture Visir himself. That's because the boss itself isn't the problem. It's the battleground you're standing on and your two Zelda partners were... First, let's start with the gimmick of the level. This is the most tedious level. Hands down, in Triforce Heroes. It makes my blood turn cold every time I know it's coming. Alright, so in the second half of the Stone Corridors, the level presents platforms that tip over if you put too much weight to one side. Think of it like a scale that tips over. The big problem here is that it's an intimidating mechanic. You don't know what the other Zelda players are thinking, and it's easy to send all three of you to your death if you don't do it right. It's godly tedious. It can be really long and strenuous, and if you have a Zelda player that is an idiot, it becomes 10 times worse. But now, we have to bring this godforsaken hellhole of stupidity into this boss fight. But what you have to do is tip the scale upward to hit the bird on his lovely perch, but... Ah oh, 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 oh. What the hell was Nintendo thinking making this god... Damn, fight! Alright, so I guess I got to cover the rebuttals I guess will be coming my way. Yes, if you happen to have a cooperative team, yes, Vulture Vizier can be easier. But, if you're playing with random strangers, I think I've had an 80% chance of failing this level in boss. Yes, you can use the Boomeranger outfit to brutally destroy this boss, but sometimes your teammates don't know that. So they'll try playing Ego on your ass and try to deal with the boss their own way. The biggest bloody sin this boss has committed is an atrocious gimmick. Zelda players trying to play Leroy Jenkins on the bird, plus you have to be really lucky to have cooperative Zelda players who know what they're doing. No wonder this bird is a vulture, because it's probably going to eat my dead body after my countless adventures with this goddamn level and goddamn boss. 